What we're talking about in this series helps not just your relationship with God, but all of your relationships. It's the sort of stuff that will improve. If you take it to heart and apply it to your lives, it'll improve any relationship, including your relationship with God. Today, we're going to talk about one of the tools that will help you in that regard. It's a very important thing. But for the sake of those of you who were not here last week, and to remind the rest of us who were here last week, let's take a look at what we have already covered. Last week's message was entitled, Keeping It Real. And I encourage you to be honest, especially with yourself and with God. Just if God's on the hook in your life, if you're holding him accountable, if he somehow in your mind is responsible, he's to blame, and you have him on the hook, so to speak, be honest. Tell him that that's how it is. That's how you feel. And then invite him to help you with that, to, to help you not only be honest, but uh, get unstuck from that place you are at emotionally and spiritually where God's on the hook. And because of that, there's some distance there and it's keeping you from from developing or pursuing that relationship, it's keeping that relationship from getting any better. Now, the, the, the fact that that's a, a, a real part of our lives, I mean, the, if we're honest, we all at some point or another have or are currently or will have God on the hook in our thoughts and our, our feelings. We're, we're gonna see him as the responsible party because he didn't do something that we thought he should, or he did do something that we didn't think was right. He didn't handle the situation the way we wanted him to, and so on. And so, so, so he ends up on the hook. And even for people who wouldn't identify themselves as Christ followers, you, you wouldn't say, and maybe you're here today, maybe you're a guest, you're new to our church, you're checking it out, you're here at the invitation of a friend, and, and you're, you're in a place where you're thinking, well, I, I want to see who this God is that, 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 uh, that I'm told about, that, that you believe in, and, and I want to see if he's actually somebody that I want to, you know, entrust my heart and my life to. And, and often a sticking point for people who are in that place, maybe for you it's currently true, is, that, well, if God's so good, if he's as good as people tell me he is, then why doesn't he do something about and then there's a number of things that go in that blank about the suffering in the world or about uh, poverty or why doesn't he do something about... And there are a number of things that even if you don't have much faith or any faith at all, if you're entertaining the idea of a God in heaven, then, then this is the snag you run into. The same faith, even if it's very minuscule, that believes God could also believes that God should. Like, well, if there is a good God in heaven, if he loves us, then he should do... X, Y, or Z. And when we come to Christ and actually have a personal relationship with him, the more we learn and are convinced that he can, the more we're convinced that he should. And so this doesn't get better as our relationship with Christ improves. Sometimes it gets worse. We're more likely, the more we know he's capable of, the more likely we are to put him on the hook. And I left you with this question last week. God, the thing I have you on the hook for is what? Is, and, and you fill in the blank here. I had somebody talk to me uh, after last week and they said, you know, uh, as we went through last week's message, she was telling me, she said, I, I didn't think I had God on the hook for anything until you got to this point. And then when I looked at that, I realized, oh, I do. And, and it was a very emotional thing because they in their mind, it compartmentalizes. It's like, yeah, well, I don't have God on the hook for this thing over here, but in fact, I really do. And the realization came in that moment. And that's what I've been praying for, is for us to get honest with ourselves, get honest with God. If God's on the hook, then, then let's just acknowledge that, admit that, and ask him for his help. Let's be honest and ask for help. And that was your takeaway last week. All right, today we're going to talk about this tool that'll help all your relationships. It involves this dynamic. The blame game. The blame game is not anything new. It started in the garden. God created Adam and Eve, put them in a perfect environment. They had a perfect relationship with each other and with God. All was paradise. All was awesome. Until they disobeyed and ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And after they had done that, they were ashamed. They were hiding. Their disobedience was sin and it introduced death into the human experience. And God came to the garden one day and he said, hey, what's going on? 
And the first thing out of Adam's mouth was, the wife you gave me gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. In other words, if you, God, hadn't given me a wife that puts God on the hook, then I wouldn't have done what I did. But she gave it to me and she is, after all, the wife you gave me. So, really? I, I, don't suppose, I don't suppose it would help any that I actually previewed these. But I did not make them. Let me engage in the blame game here for a moment. I, I did not make them because I know how to spell spouse. But apparently the person I asked to do this does not know how to spell. See how we do that? Not my fault. It's that person's fault. And he and I will have a talk afterwards. <laughs> but it's what we do. See, at, it, nothing's new about this. And it started at the beginning and it's been going on ever since. So then it comes to Eve and Eve does the same thing. She says, well, it's not my fault, the serpent. You know, if you hadn't let that serpent loose in the garden, it's like, what was that about God? And so she's gonna put God on the hook. And so it has been all the way down the road. Now, if you don't get anything else out of today's service other than the correct way to spell spouse, I'd like you to get this, this idea. Beware of the blame game. Nobody ever wins it. The blame game is not a good thing. And like some games, it is unwinnable. We, we play the game because we think we can win. Adam is blaming God and Eve because he thinks that's going to keep himself off the hook. Hey, if I get God on the hook and Eve on the hook, maybe we'll throw the serpent in there. Gosh, I wish I had some friends, but there aren't any around yet. I, I, I put anybody but myself on the hook because, you know, if I play the blame game skillfully, I can win. But the truth of the matter is that nobody wins the blame game. But we keep trying, don't we? See, if God's not on the hook, then maybe I'll just put myself on the hook. It's like maybe, maybe after last week you worked it through enough to, to, and you were honest and you said, God, I need some help with this. And God's like, hey, I was really there for you and I was faithful. Don't, don't you see who I am and what I was actually doing? Said, yeah, you're, yeah, God, you're not on the hook. So it must be my fault. And then we put ourselves on the hook. And then we go about beating ourselves and holding ourselves accountable, making ourselves miserable. I hate when I do this to myself. But I do it sometimes. All of us do. Or maybe you, you're, you're thinking, no, God's not on the hook. It wasn't his fault. And it's not my fault either. It's my boss's fault. That's right. It's my boss's fault. Like in, in this case, he didn't tell me the correct way to spell spouse. That was his job to do that, right? Not my responsibility, my boss's job. He didn't give me that report to finish in time. He gave it to me on Thursday afternoon and said he wanted it by the end of the day. It's like, how is that fair? It's my boss's fault that I fell down on the job. Never mind the fact that he told me two weeks ago that it was going to be due, but hey, let's not confuse the facts here with the issue. The issue is my boss is on the hook. Or maybe, maybe it's not that, it's those kids of mine. You know, family life would be a dream if we just didn't have kids. Like those disobedient, disrespectful, self-absorbed, selfish kids, demanding and impatient all the time. Are you kidding me? It's like, get me off of this merry-go-round. We'd have peace in this house. I might actually enjoy my life. I might actually enjoy my marriage if it wasn't for those kids. Why did we decide to have them in the first place, right? Or maybe, turn around's fair play, come on. Maybe it's the kids saying, yeah, I feel the same way about you, mom, dad. And if it wasn't for my parents, if they weren't so mean. If they weren't so absentee. If they weren't so whatever it is. 
you know, but, but th that's who they are. That's how they are. That's what they do. That's, that's my parent and my parents responsible. I, I dealt with that when my parents got divorced. I was 15 years old and, and it was all my dad's fault. And it was my dad's fault for years because he was having an affair and he decided to leave my mom. And it's like, what's up with that? And he's ruined my life and he's to blame and he's on the hook. And very seriously and emotionally, it, it was a, it was a thing. And then as I got older, I, I managed to get my dad off the hook. And then I started putting my mom on the hook. Well, she'd been a better wife and a better this and, you know, and I went down that road for a little while. And all the while behind all of that, I had God on the hook, right? Uh, maybe, maybe you're relating to one of the examples that I'm giving, but, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a club you're a part of or some neighbors you have or, or may, maybe it's a a situation at work that involves a, a whole group that you're a part of and you're tasked with certain responsibilities or, or, or maybe it's your in-laws. Do we need to even go there? I mean, like, <laughs> in-laws, you know what I'm saying? Extended families, like, or, or maybe it's a blended family and that makes the in-laws dynamic even more complicated. Whoever it is that you're thinking of, if somehow in your mind and heart you're thinking they're to blame, they're the ones that caused this, if only they hadn't done what they did or did do what they sh should have done but didn't do, or if only they hadn't said what they said, if they'd only handled it differently, and we've got them on the hook. Beware of the blame game. Nobody ever wins the blame game. And here's why. Because blaming creates distance in the relationship. Acceptance creates intimacy or closeness. So you can play the blame game and create distance between you and God, you and yourself, you and your spouse, or whoever it is that you've got on the hook. You can create distance or you can accept. Accept the person, accept what has happened. You may not agree with it, you may not like it, it might hurt. But you just accept the fact that that is and give up the drive to assign blame and you'll bring closeness to the relationship. And I finally had to do that with my dad. I finally had to do that with a lot of people that I've had relationship with over the years as I've discovered that the blame, blame game is an unwinnable game. So now I want to have you take a couple of minutes and listen to a presentation by Brene Brown you may not recognize the name, but she is a recognized uh, public speaker, scholar, uh, teacher. She does a number of TED Talks, if you're familiar with those. She's currently a professor of research at the University of Houston, where she uh, serves in the graduate school for sociology. So she knows her stuff, and she knows it so well that she's able to reduce it down to an understandable level where we can grab a, a handle. And she's doing in what you're about to watch exactly what we talked about last week. She's keeping it real. And so there's a certain four letter word that will pop out at the beginning. And I, I just mentioned that for, for the sake of some of you who, um, who might, you know, bristle at that and then get hung up there, get stuck and then miss all the good stuff that she has to say. And, and in the interest of keeping it real, come on. I mean, we all have those moments. We get really frustrated. Something happens like we're, somebody's on the hook. It's like, oh, I'm so ticked at you right now. And, and we, you know, because we're good Christians, we don't say certain things, but we think them. And every once in a while, they actually come out of our mouth. Come on, let's just be honest with ourselves, each other, and let's see what we can learn from this that we're about to watch. Take a look. Brene Brown. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set. And I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this. Damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who is my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. 
And he got back like at 1030. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? (laughs) What's going on? Um, So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, like dial tone. Because he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na-na-na-na thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. Very helpful and very insightful. And uh, hey, if I'm honest with myself, I recognize some of my own tendencies and bad habits as she was presenting. The, the instinct, and that's what it is, it's not necessarily a conscious thought process, but it's an instinct that comes from the original sin, from the fall. It's part of our fallen human nature. The instinct is to blame somebody, anybody but ourselves. And, and that drive is something we need to be aware of. It's also something we need to be honest about, something we need to ask God to help us with for all the reasons that we've already talked about and a few more that we're going to discover together as we look to God's Word and see what He has to say about this. We're going to look at a passage in the book of Acts early in the life of the church, and it has to do with a couple of leaders in the church. Paul and Silas are the individuals. Paul is uh, someone who was an enemy of Christianity. He was a persecutor of believers. He comes to Christ through a dramatic conversion, and Silas is another leader, and they've teamed up together, and they're in the city of Philippi, and they're presenting Jesus, and people are coming to Christ, and miracles are happening, and there's this certain slave girl who, um, she's uh, able to tell people's future, she's a fortune teller, and the, the Bible says she's able to do that because she's got a spirit, an evil spirit, a demonic spirit that helps her to see things in the future. And so she's telling people's fortunes. And as a result, because she's a slave girl, she doesn't keep any of the money that's generated by that. Her owners are. And uh, she's following Paul and Silas around saying, hey, listen to these guys. These guys are good. And just really drawing a lot of attention to herself. She's actually saying the right thing, the truth. These guys are here to tell you about how to get saved. You know, listen to these guys. And it was just very annoying. And the scripture tells us this went on for days to the point where finally Paul had had enough and he turned around and he cast the demon out of her. Result, she couldn't tell the future anymore. And her masters were furious because now their income sources dried up. So Paul and Silas are now the enemy. And so they got the crowd stirred up and some people to accuse them. They dragged them in to to, uh, the authorities and uh, they end up uh, being... Well, let's read and see what God's word says about what happened. It says in verse 22, Acts chapter 16, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates, so these are the authorities, ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Now, do you think perhaps if you're Silas, you're you're thinking, this is all your fault, Paul. Couldn't you have just left her alone? You cast the demon out of her and you started this. Really, Paul? Really? We endured her for days. Did you have to do that? You know, I don't think that actually crossed his mind, but it would have crossed my mind, I think, if I was with Paul. 
The crowd joined in the attack. They were stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was ordered to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, made sure that it was extra hard to escape if they tried, and then fastened their feet in the stocks. So, you know, those are clamps that go over the ankles. So even if you get yourself untied or whatever, you're not going to be able to walk. You're not going to be able to go anywhere. They were stuck in the inner cell in prison for nothing more than preaching Jesus and in particular casting a demon out of a fortune teller slave girl. Now in that moment, I can well imagine the temptation was there. I certainly would feel it to blame the owners of the slave for Paul and Silas to be tempted to blame each other. It's like, really, you had to do this, you know, and that back and forth or to blame the magistrates for exercising their authority unfairly and unjustly. And ultimately, I mean, because this is always lurking behind the scenes, this is always the undercurrent, the backdrop that's there, ultimately to blame God. God, you could have you prevented this from happening. I mean, come on, God, after all, we were serving you, doing your work. We were presenting the truth about your son, Jesus. And, and you saw this coming and you could have prevented it. It's like, where were you when we needed you? You know, it's that feeling that we sometimes have when we put God on the hooks. Like, where was he? God, you let me down. I was counting on you. This is not supposed to work out like this, right? So they're in the jail for hours, feet in the stocks. And it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were blaming each other. No, actually, it doesn't say that. It says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Are you kidding me? Singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. I just love this when God comes through in a great big way. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. So they, they, their chains that bound them came loose. The stocks were released from their feet, ankles. And it says the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill some of the prisoners. No, he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. And the reason that he was about to do that is because that's how it worked in the Roman uh, system of things. If, if a, a guard was charged with the responsibility of making sure that prisoners stay in, stayed imprisoned, if they escaped on that guard's watch, that guard was put to death and he'd rather kill himself than be put to death by his higher ups. But Paul says, don't do that. I know what you're about to do and I understand why. Don't do that. We're all here. Even though the doors are open, we're not planning to escape. There's something else going on here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. It's like he was about to take his own life for fear that if he didn't, the Romans would. And now he doesn't understand what's going on. But there's been this earthquake, and these doors miraculously open, and all the prisoners are loose, but they're not going anywhere. It's like, what the heck's going on here? He brought them out, Paul and Silas, and he said the most honest, most visceral, most appropriate thing. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So I, I, I was a dead man a moment ago. Either I was going to kill myself, the Romans were, and, and something else bigger and higher than the Roman government, something bigger and higher than my ability to keep you in prison is going on here. I recognized I'm in jeopardy. I need to be saved. This is a great question for you and me to ask ourselves. What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas give a great, a clear and succinct answer. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in the Lord Jesus. He's the one who's doing this. He's the one we've been talking about. He's the reason we were put in jail in the first place. If you believe in him, you will be saved. And the text in chapter 16 goes on to say that he believed that his family believed, his household, his slaves believed. There were a bunch of them that came to Christ. They turned around and were baptized. They shared a meal together. There was a pretty phenomenal thing that took place on that occasion. 
And I, I just want to encourage you to, to take away from that story this. Instead of focusing on blame, focus on the activity of God in the situation. See, when something bad happens or something confusing happens or something unexpected happens or something disappointing happens, and, and that happens to all of us all the time. It, we're, we're up camping this weekend at Farragut, my wife and I, and, and we drove in for today to, to be with you all. And, and up there in the, in the campground, things have happened. There was, a, there was an accident with a bicycle and there was a miscommunication here and there's some dogs got into a little fight over here. And it's like, and, and I, I, knowing that I was going to talk with you about this, I, I noticed I was obser- observant of the tendency we all have, including me, to assign blames. Like, well, that happened because, you know, you know, and just when stuff happens, we just do that kind of automatically without thinking. But, but when we do that, we miss what God's doing. Now, now, don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting that God put Paul and Silas in the jail. He didn't. The magistrates did. Let's just be clear about that. And Paul and Silas didn't do anything wrong. God didn't set that up. But God saw it coming, and God could have prevented it, but he said, now the magistrates are going to be unjust, the crowd's going to be unruly, they're going to be falsely accused, they've done nothing wrong, but I'm going to let it happen because I know the jailer's heart is open, and his family and his household, and I'm going to use this situation. So it won't be pleasant, Paul and Silas won't like it, but I'll do the miracle that I need to do to make this all happen. And Paul and Silas while they're in the prison about midnight, are praying and getting a sense of this. That's why they're singing. They don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but they sense God's hand at work. And it's like, we can focus on assigning blame. How in the heck did we get here? This is not what I planned on today when I woke up this morning, right? They could have focused on that, but instead they said, let's focus on what God might be doing. It's like, God, I know you didn't cause this situation, but but I know you have this amazing ability to take bad situations and leverage them for your good. So you must be up to something here. And, and I'd like to know what it is because I want to cooperate with it. And so as they're praying and singing and praising God, God's like, all right, wait for it. Wait for it. Boom. Big earthquake. Miracle happens. Ah. And the jailer comes in. And it's like, all right, I get it, God. And they present Christ and all these people come to Christ. And eternities are changed. The jailer's going to heaven, not hell now, because Paul and Silas were willing to focus on the activity of God in the situation rather than on the blame game. And they would have perhaps missed out entirely had they done the opposite. Let me put it to you another way. What is God doing? Here's a great question to ask yourself when something disillusioning happens and you're tempted to put God or somebody else on the hook. What is God doing that he wants me to participate in? Now, again, not saying God's causing the situation. More often than not, he has nothing to do with causing the situation. Once in a while, he does. But most of the time, he doesn't. Usually, situations happen just because people make choices or, or the enemy of our soul is involved or our, our fallen human nature gets in the way or whatever it is. But when the situation unfolds, God's like, I can use this. I can do something with this. I've got a, an idea here. And, and then God masterfully and wonderfully decides that he's going to leverage it for good. Romans 8 says that God is able to take those things that are negative and bad. He causes all things, including the really worst of things, to work together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And those last two caveats are very important. Those that are focusing on him and what he's actually up to. And so we, we get to a place where hopefully... We're, we're able to um, say to God, God, I, I, I don't enjoy this. This is not what I signed up for. This is not a good thing. I'm not, I'm not happy about this, but I know you're not on the hook and I'm not going to put anybody else on the hook. What I'm going to do instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the opportunity to show me how you're using this situation and allow me the privilege of participating in what you're doing and see something amazing happen. You see, God comes through sometimes, just not in the way we want him to. Isaiah 55 says this. It says, God's ways are above our ways, and his thoughts are above our thoughts. How much above? Isaiah 55 says, as far above our ways and thoughts as the heavens are above the earth. Like how many light years away are some of the galaxies and stars we see in the night sky? That's how far above our puny, 
preconceived idea, our pea brain ideas of how God should work. God's just saying, you, you, you just don't have the ability to comprehend what I'm up to most of the time because my ways are as high above yours. My thoughts, my approach is so much higher than yours. You just need to trust me and I'll show you the things that you need to do. And that's what Paul and Silas are doing at midnight in that prison. And I just love it because then God, who saw all this and, and, and orchestrated the response of the jailer, God, God just came through in an amazing and powerful way. I want to, I'm going to take a few moments and look at one final passage in the New Testament because in part because of something Brene Brown showed us in that short animated presentation. She said that the blame game is the discharging of discomfort and pain. That was a pretty graphic little animation that we watched, but it was so helpful. I'm uncomfortable. I'm feeling pain. And the only thing I know to do, my instinct, my default MO, is to discharge that by assigning blame. God, spouse, boss, parent, kids, myself, them, whoever they are. And God says there's a better way, a healthier way to discharge that discomfort and pain. Here's what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. He says, in your anger, do not sin. He doesn't say don't be angry. Ang anger is an emotion that he gave us the capacity for. Ang anger is not a sin, but it often leads to sin if we don't handle it constructively. And that's a lot of what today's message is about. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Don't get too literal about that. I, I hear some people, it's like, yeah, well, we're going to work this out before we go to sleep. Yeah, sometimes the anger pops up after the sun's down. Let's just not get hung up on the... What it's saying is, don't, don't let that linger. Deal with it soon. Keep the account short. Don't let it go on for days and weeks. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. This is the enemy of your soul and the enemy of your relationship with God, your husband, your wife, your kids, your boss, the people in this room. The enemy of your relationships, the devil himself, is going to try to use this very thing to destroy those relationships. He's going to try to get you to put God on the hook to put your spouse, O-U-S-E, on the hook, to put yourself on the hook, and all these other individuals, he's going to try to get you to put them on the hook because he knows, better than we do sometimes, he knows that putting people on the hook, the blame game creates distance in the relationship, and that's what he's after. He wants to destroy that relationship. And if he can do something to do that, to accomplish that, to get you to, to fall for it, to play the blame game, then he feels like he's succeeded. So, so you say, well, all right, that's easier said than done. Right. We need God's help. And that's why he says in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't make him sad. Instead, ask him to help you. The Holy Spirit's the one with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We talk about having Jesus in our heart. Jesus is in our heart because his spirit dwells in here. And his spirit dwelling in here is God's promise that on the day of redemption, that there will be a wonderful transformation and we'll, be, we'll enter into a forever relationship in our forever family with God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by playing the blame game. Instead, get rid, verse 31, of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. How do you do that? We talked about it last week. How do you get rid of all these things? By asking, by being honest and asking God to help you with this. It's like, God, it's in my nature to play the blame game. I need you to help me not do that. So I'm going to leave you with a final question. This is your takeaway for the day today. I want you to ask yourself this question. Ask God to help you with this very question and be honest about it. Am I trying to prove that they are to blame or am I trying to improve the relationship? In other words, is the hook the point? And I've got to find somebody to blame because I feel like I need some, how did Brene Brown put it? Some semblance of control or is my focus on the relationship. I'm just, what happened, it happened, it's unfortunate, it's tragic, it, but I'm not going to worry about whose fault it is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on improving the relationship and going forward from here. And that's all the more important when it comes to our relationship with God. We started with God in week one 
We've been talking about some of our other relationships here today, but as I said, ultimately it comes back around to God himself. One of the people that I was talking with recently about this was saying that, you know, at first their, their reaction when a loved one passed away, their reaction was to blame God. You took them from me. And that's a natural response many of us have when we lose a loved one. And then they began to process and realize, no, that's not, that's not what happened. There was a, 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 a medical reason for what took place. It wasn't God's doing. It's just part of living in this broken world that we live in, in, in this fallen world. But then they started to blame themselves. And then they blame their partner, their spouse, and back and forth with all of that. And then they realized, no, there was nothing they could do. It just, it's one of those things that happened. And then it came back around to God again. It's like, but, but God, even though it wasn't your fault, you didn't cause it. It wasn't our fault. We couldn't do anything to prevent it. It wasn't my partner's fault. They couldn't either. But it was your fault because you didn't tell us. You didn't, you didn't let us in. You didn't warn us ahead of time. You didn't get our attention and say, hey, maybe you could do something to prevent this. Like, why didn't you do that? That'd be Paul and Silas. You know, why, why didn't you warn us that if we cast the demon out of that slave girl, this all would happen? It's like, and we hold God accountable. And I, I just want us today to embrace the fact that there is a God in heaven. He's the one and only true God, the one we worshiped earlier, the one I've been talking about, who is the God who is faithful whose ways are higher than our ways, whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and who's often up to something that we sometimes are oblivious to because we're playing the blame game. Let's instead focus on the faithfulness of our God and what he's up to. Let's participate in that, and let's just abandon the blame game. I'm going to let the band share with us a song. And as we spend these moments together, let it be a time, a personal time with you. Be honest with God about whatever thing you might have him on the hook for or other people in your life. And let's focus on the faithfulness of God. And I'll be back to pray with you in just a moment.